Okay, so uh, let's start with the initial presentation. Hi everyone and welcome here in the third session of Corpus Curiosum of this fourth edition. Um, we are very happy to be here another week. And yeah, let's start with this session. As you all know, probably Corpus Curiosum is this a uh, project that is started due to the pandemic and the lockdown, right? That aims to stimulate critical thinking in neuroscience through engaging with early career researchers and in fostering discussion, right? So the idea is that we do this parallelism with the Corpus Caiosum. So in the same way that the Corpus Caiosum is the part that uh, the part of the brain that keeps the two hemispheres, uh, hemispheres united, right? A corpus curiosum or curiosity should be the part that, or the critical thinking, right? This um, should be the, the skill that gets all neuroscience and all neuroscientists uh, together, right? And that's why we are here today. Um, these are our values that we have been holding from the beginning, which is support early career researchers as normally we are the ones facing more difficulties, right? When starting our academia career also embracing diversity and being access accessible. And that's why uh, we hold all, all our sessions always in the internet and we record them eventually, like later. So everyone can access uh, to this uh, forum that we are creating, right? We are very happy to be supported by the FEMS and by the Ibro another edition uh, because, well, they've been supporting us from the very beginning and in this edition they are supporting, supporting us once again. So thanks a lot to them and thanks especially to the IBRO because uh, it's the second time that we were awarded with the diversity grant by IBRO, so by IBRO, sorry. And yeah, so this is us, I guess that so like, now you guys know us, Alba, Faisal, and me, myself, Ines. We are, uh, well, at different stages of our academic career, and we are located in different places around Europe. But yeah, we are not alone any longer because now we have our very beautiful ambassadors uh, coordinated by, by Mariela Trinchero, which is our community manager and yeah, part of the team. And yeah, well, big thank you to all the, the very nice ambassadors that we have supporting us and helping us from all the different parts of the world and collaborating to spread the, the word of this uh, project. And well, this is about you guys. Um, right now we have attendees coming from more than 45 countries. This is one of the magic part of the internet, right? That even if we are in here just with a screen, we are actually coming from all different places, which is very cool and also an opportunity to do networking. And well, this is today's speaker, Javier de Felipe. We are very happy to have him here today. Javier de Felipe is a research professor at the Instituto Cajal in, in Spain, in Madrid. His expertise lies in the correlation of light and electron microscopy. Another of his principal interests is the analysis of alterations of cortical circuits in, in epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, his laboratory is involved in the development of a vari variety of software tools to examine the anatomical design of brain circuits. Another of his principal interests is the study of the, the history of cortical histology and circuitry. And he's also fascinated by the link between the study of the brain and the art. And he has been involved in organizing and curating curating numerous, numerous exhibitions around the world. And well, I'm sure that you guys probably all know him uh, because he has participated in writing several articles, chapters of books and about, about his, yeah, his subject and the influence of Santiago Cajal in modern neuroscience. So I think that we are gonna have a very fascinating talk today, which is uh, titled The Human Brain, A Philosophical and Scientific Perspective. Uh, first of all, th thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, talk. I think that this is a great idea, the one that you have organized, just to invite people, just to discuss different aspects of neuroscience. And today, well, I'm going to have first an uh, introduction, then I will, I will talk about variations in cortical circuits, and then about what the neural substrate makes a human being 
human is something that is amazing because in the 21st century we don't have an answer to to this what is special about our brain uh, to make us uh, able to make, have uh, these cognitive uh, characteristics we don't know at, at all and we will discuss today what is the feeling in general that you will see is, uh, is unbelievable sometimes that there is, there is a lot of disagreement about this. So <clears throat> these are the basic elements of the brain. You have the vascular network, you have the input and the output, and then you have two major types of neurons, projection, projection neurons and interneurons, glia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, nerve fibers, extrinsic and intrinsic. And the question is, uh, what is the and the great challenge is, is to find out how neural sanglia are arranged and how neural circuits contribute to the functional organization of the brain to, to make a give rise to behavior. That is the major question. But in, indeed, this is really what we have in any part of the brain. This only very appear, appear, appears to be very simple elements of uh, yes, these elements. So, but um, an, an important issue is that the structural design uh, must be examined separately in particular regions and species because um, whatever you analyze in a given part of the brain of uh, any species is very hard or many times impossible to extrapolate to another region. And that is one of the major problems that we have when we are dealing with the state of the human uh, brain because for obvious reasons and uh, ethical reasons, we cannot make uh, many of the experiments that you can do in, in, in experimental animals. And the, the problem is how much of information that you get from a, uh, another mammal or another species can be extrapolated. In general, people think that they will, and we will see that the, everything is basically the same, but we will see in, in this uh, talk that this is not the case. We are special, but not only because, not because we are humans, we are special like, as any other species, the cats, the dogs, uh, giraffes, uh, everything are uh, unique. <clears throat> so let me see here. I would like to start also with this beautiful words of Cajal when he started to study the human brain. He say, I felt at that time the most lived lively curiosity, somehow and romantic, for the enigmatic organization of the organ of the soul. To know the brain, we say to ourselves in our idealistic enthusiasm, is equivalent to discover the material course of thought and will. That is to say, how we can create in these fantastic uh, miniatures or the uh, writing uh, music. Uh, they the make uh, beautiful uh, paintings and uh, or just building uh, 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 the building. No, this is something that are uh, properties, emerging properties of our brain, and it's amazing that uh, now that uh, the study of the brain is something that no many people uh, find interesting. However. Uh, we have uh, the reflection about the brain is something that no, no many people is doing. We, we are our brains, and that means that the, the, our humanity is, is our brain. And that is just only because of that, that will be very, very important to analyze the human brain. Is what is the special about the human brain? Because we are our brain, our thoughts, uh, history, everything is in our brain. But however, if we start to talk about alterations, then most people understand that the study of the brain is important because it's involved in uh, terrible diseases like uh, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, schizophrenia, epilepsy, depression. So one of the major uh, objectives in neuroscience is to try to find out what is the design, the structural design and how the circuits of the brain uh, interact to give rise to behavior and, uh, and, and cognition. And that is something that is uh, completely also unknown. So it's uh, clear, uh, everybody 
uh, I said that the, the evolution of the brain, and we have an increase in the size, you can have here, you see the Australopithecus afarensis, Homo erectus and the Homo sapiens, you can see the increase in the size of the brain, just because we know that because in the, the, the school has been increased. And something that is uh, amazing is that uh, about 40,000 years ago, what happened is something that has been called the human revolution because uh, at the same time in many parts of the, of the world, it start to appear these kind of figures that were um, indication that there is a um, representations that uh, give rise to to the, to uh, to think that we have the capability to have abstract uh, abstraction. So that is something that happened just only forty thousand years ago. Before uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, presentation that are geometric iconog iconographic representations that also represent the probably indicate some kind of a, a behavior, astral behavior, but it was only an, until more or less 40,000 years ago when it was very clear these figures represent an, a, a, the demonstration that uh, we have the capability to have this capacity, uh, ability of abstraction. These are the famous lion mess, the lion man, who is the, the head is of a lion and the body is of a human. So that means that our ancestors, we, when we, had, we were the Homo sapiens, we start to have this kind of capabilities to develop. So it happened that in, in only 200,000 years, uh, more or less, we have been able to change the world. This is the, you can see the earth, you can see the cities in the night. And not only that, but also we have been able to reach the moon and start uh, walk in the moon, like uh, with these famous words of Neil Armstrong, one small step for a man, one giant leap for a mankind. So you can see this amazing, how the humans we have been able, there's a very few, uh, only about, as I said, 200 years able to do this. So you can see here on the left, our ancestors, the Australopithecus start to walk in, in, in Africa, in Latoli. So this uh, uh, marvelous trip from Africa to the moon, how was that possible? That is something that is uh, a very, it's incredible, no? That in a very short time, we have been able to do, this, to do these things. So the question is, who am I? How we can acquire complex skills? So the late appearance of the neocortex and its expansion and differentiation in mammals represent another principal event of the evolution of mammalian brain. Is this due only to the increase in brain size and therefore in the number of cities or there is also a change in cortical cities? This is one of the major questions in neuroscience and the funny thing or the interesting thing is that still we have this question. And it's amazing that we don't have a clear response to these uh, questions. The problem is that, that uh, there is a large variation in, the, in size in the human. These are normal brains. For example, this is 860 grams, and this is another brain from 1,070, uh, 70, 60 grams. So this is about twice or even more the size. Imagine the number of neurons, synapse, the difference. However, they can be from uh, individuals, individuals completely identical. And this is a, a very nice example of uh, Lord Byron and Anatole France. Both of them were the great genius of literature, was romanticism, Lord Byron, everyone know, and Anatole France, was a poet that was a Nobel Prize for literature. And the brains of Anatole France was only 100, uh, 100 grams and uh, Lord Byron two kilograms almost. So, no, so the size of the brain of Lord Byron was about twice of the Anatole France, but both were uh, great and genius. So, so the size of the brain is, uh, is, is hard to, uh, to interpret in, function, in terms of behavior, cognition, and capabilities. 
is something that uh, uh, we know, but people don't, don't, don't think very much about these issues, okay? So, the, in addition, the, the physiological properties, neurotransmitters, neuroactive peptides, receptors, ion channels, and other compounds currently expressed by cortical neurons are not unique to the neocortex. And as I said before, the all the neocortical regions contain the same uh, uh, elements that in other parts, in any uh, other uh, species, projection neurons, interneurons, neuroglia, nerve fibers, and blood vessels. Everything looks the same. But the, so what is special about the human cerebral cortex is a long standing question in neuroscience. And indeed, we're coming, coming back to Cajal, is uh, Cajal was a pioneer also in the study of the structure of the, of the brain. Yeah, we're thinking, what is special about our brain? He said, at that time, they generally accepted the idea that the differences between the brain of non-human mammals, cat, dog, monkeys, and that of man are only quantitative, seems to me unlikely and even a little offensive to human dignity. Language, the capability of abstraction, the ability to create concepts, uh, and finally, the art of inventing ingenious instruments, do these facets not sit, uh, seem to, to indicate even admitting fundamental structural correspondences with the animals, the system of original resources, or something qualitatively new that justified the psychological nobility of homo, homo sapiens. So that was exactly the, the kind of thought that people have at the early uh, in the, the 20th century at the beginning. So what is special? So this is the great enigma of the different uh, words and uh, which are uh, mental words. So different at the same time, so similar. You can see here this Animals looks very much similar to the behavior that we have apparently. Uh, we don't know what they are thinking, uh, but we have many aspects of the behavior of animals which are quite similar to humans. So the question is, what is special about the human uh, cortex and what makes us different to other species? There are, <clears throat> uh, at the very beginning of the study of the cortex, there are uh, there were two main major uh, views. One is the organology, and the other is called the uniformity. The organology was basically defended by von Economo, and he said because of the different structure of the cortical surface, it can be uh, virtually be broken up into single organs, to each of which may be assigned a different function according to its structure. So each part of the cortex was uh, completely different to the others. And uh, uniformity was defended by many, um, the vast majority of researchers, even at present, that they say that the morphologic differences between cortical areas are accidental. The functional differences of the various cortical areas are a function of the different connections with different projection systems and with uh, different target structures. These are the two major views of the, of the brain. And that is, this is the famous map of Broadman. Um, uh, this is from a um, book of Bomb Valley, uh, The Socrates of Man, um, 1951. And they, they say something that is very interesting. After a long and careful study of the human isocortes, the main impression we have retained is that the vast, vast areas are so closely similar in the structure as to make any attempt to division unprofitable, if not impossible. And that is something that happened uh, also to me with, in, the, in the lab when we see a preparation of the cortex. If we don't have a map of broad man uh, closed, uh, then we don't know really which area of the, uh, you are analyzing. These are, so this is a remarkable feature, is, is, uh, is a, a, the apparently uniformity. You can see here different areas that you can distinguish because I put here the names, but if, you, if I don't say that this is area 3B, area 18, or area 10, for example, is practically impossible to distinguish the different cortical areas based on the site architecture. This is something uh, that is true. I mean, uh, 
you need to know when you pick up a section of, uh, to analyze in the lab, you ask, uh, where did you get this? Uh, I think that is from uh, area four in the plot map. And you go, you go here and then, okay. You know, but if you just only see these preparations, these pictures, is nobody will be able to find out which from which part of the court, of the court has been taken a set in layer in area four, which is the motor cortex, which are very large neurons in, in layer five, and individual cortex as we will see in, in a second. So in 19, uh, in 1980, there was a very, very important paper that has a lot of influence in, the, in the science is the published by uh, Rocker, Hyons, and Powell. That uh, they published a paper in Brain that we, uh, they were analyzing the total number of neurons in a small blocks of uh, sections of the, of the brain, 25 microns thick, 30 microns the width, and from the uh, surface uh, to the white matter in the mouse, rat, cat, and monkey, from different societal architectonic areas including different functions like the motor, somatic, sensory, frontal, parietal, and temporal. So that's to take a view of the, in all, practically in all brain regions. So they found that the absolute number, or better to say, they reported that the number, absolute number of neurons was approximately 110 in all areas and species. And they say, in mammalian evolution, the area of neocortex increased in larger brains, but the number of and proportion of neural types through uh, the depth remains constant. The intrinsic structure of the neocortex is basically more uniform than previously thought, and the difference in the situ situ architecture and function reflects difference in, in connections. That, that is something is very this was, uh, critical because now, uh, the idea is that you can analyze any uh, cortical area of, of any species, and the, what you find there, you can extrapolate to the human, to, to the human or to any other species, because every, basically you are analyzing the same thing in all regions. So basically, the cities are similar, and that, that the, the the implication of this is is, is tremendous because. Now, for example, you are uh, analyzing, for example, uh, using uh, experimental animals to analyze Alzheimer's or schizophrenia or many other uh, uh, diseases using models with the idea that the circuits are similar or very similar. In, with the, and that is a major issue. If you start to discuss and to say that this is not the case, then we have a big problem. No? Uh, so not many people like uh, this idea. So. And I remember uh, this is from a paper that I published in 1984 in a, a book, uh, which uh, there's something that has, has been also is uh, many people uh, like it because at that time in 1984, when I was in the Cajal Institute with Alfonso Fayen, we published an article in, in that we say that we have the, the same cortical layers and cellular elements exist in all. Um, species that have been analyzed. So we believe in that, even we start to, to propose that the same elements you can find in any species. And this is a, on the, here in the middle, some of cells, which is a um, major morphological uh, interneural type. Is you can see here that you can see in the monkey, the rabbit, the hedgehog, the mouse, the cat, is quite uh, similar. Basket cells, which are represent another type of interneuron very well known. Uh, you can see the morphologies are similar in the cat visual cortex or in the monkey somatosensory cortex. So the conclusion is that cortical processing of information should be performed through assembles of neurons organized into multiple small repeating uh, microcircuits. And all of these are the same in all the species. So this is the, the cerebral cortex, which is considered to be composed of multiple small repeating microcircuit elements. The thalamic afferent reach the middle layers and the upper layers. Then there are ascending and descending connections, and that the, <coughs> just providing the flow of information between upper and upper layers, and there are also horizontal connections. 
And again, it's amazing that we don't know we don't know this, uh, how these circuits are made uh, in, the, in, the, in the cortex of any species. We have more information about the mouse and rat, but still we are very far away to, to, to know with a precision the, 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 the structure of the cortical circuits. So this is the, uh, the, the final product is the the, the uh, results for interaction between the three types of information, the one that is coming from the outside world, the one that is generated in the, in, the, in the brain, because there are a lot of activity that is unconscious, activity that also is interacting with the uh, brain circuits, and then our own memories, the, the intrinsic information that we have. So, uh, the, the idea is you have the same uh, cortical elements, the units of operation, and you have from a very small mammal like a possum, you have a, a relatively few uh, microcircuit elements. And when you have a big brain like the, we have, the, the difference between them, uh, between us and these animals is the number, the complexity based in the number of circuits. This is basically what most people think about uh, the structure of the brain right now. The problem is that uh, there are more than 4,300 mammalian species. And practically, the ones that we have uh, analyzed are basically mouse, rats, and uh, somehow so human and monkeys. But the rest of uh, mammals are, has not been explored so far, or very little, or, or, or it's very interesting to, to, as we will see in a second, that when people study exotic species and they found different things, we don't like it very much that, and we don't read it, and we don't care very much. So this is this is the let me see uh, here. So this is a look at it is a funny question. How about the giraffe? This is something that we have discussed in the. When I was in United States, in California, we have a general club uh, talking about the evolution. And we also always were, we were ask, uh, uh, comparing rats, mice, and monkeys, that's all. And I remember there was a professor, a crazy mm -hmm. professor there, who <laughs> to me, and always he said, he said, how about the giraffe? I said, the giraffe, come on, I don't care. <laughs> but it's funny because then many years later, when I was giving a talk in Kenya, and then I asked if they have uh, brains from a from giraffe just to, to analyze the, the motor cortex because I was thinking that from here, from the head to the spinal cord, there are several meters. And probably the, the motor neurons must be very, very large. So we were looking in the brain of the, of the giraffe for big neurons. And what we found is that the cortex of the giraffe is a very strange. You can see in layer two here, they are like a more small clusters. And the layer one is very large. Here in layer six is quite different to other species. So this is our uh, coronal section from many different species. And then is another thing that we always, we see also in, the, in many books, test books, that we say that the human brain is highly convoluted and is uh, very uh, specific for the human. However, you can see the porpoas or the zebra, the California sea lion, they have much more convoluted brain or even the goat, you can see here, okay? So this, this kind of thing that we have a very highly convoluted brain, that is not true. We, we are only one of the many species that have a highly convoluted brain. Also, the manatee, as you can see here, the manatee has a very big brain, but it's lysencephalic, it's like a, like a mouse, but it's very big. You see, much bigger than the cat or the rabbit, and it, almost even similar to the chimpanzee or the African lion, that you can see that it's a smooth, the surface. So there are many things that we believe or we have to read in, in the in books, in textbooks that are not really true. No? Now, when we see the, another exotic species like insectivores, like the Suncus, uh, Microxorex, Talpa, or other species, you can see 
that is amazing. The Suncus Etruscus is the smallest mammal that exists in Earth. It's a very the smallest. You can see the brain of the Suncus Etruscus is only the weight is only 0.062 grams. And they have the whole thing there, the thalamus, the hippocampus, everything in a very tiny, small region. When you analyze the, the density of neurons, you can see that is about seven times greater than in the human temporal cortex. They are like, uh, the difference in the density and also the structure you can see here, layer two in, in the suncus is very dense and very narrow. When you compare like, the human, giraffe, platypus, the platypus you can see the density is so high that even it's very hard to, to make any estimation because it's full of neurons. And, so there is clear variations in neuron density and cytoarchitectonic organization. This is the human again. You can see this is a very typical microcolumnar organization, looks many uh, columns. This is the giraffe. Again, you can see these clusters of strains and the accumulation of neurons in layer two. And this is the platypus. There is almost basically there is very little neuropis. There are a very packet, no? So the basic uniformity of the neocortex is not valid for all species. So there is something that we have to keep in mind. These are variations in neurons and, uh, and in cytoarchitectonic organization. You can see here in the frontal and occipital cortex, mouse, rat, rabbit, goat, cat, etc., the lion, dog, and humans. You can see the extraordinary variations in the in density of neurons and the cytoarchitecture and also in the layers. There are layers, sometimes we, we say always that there are six layers in the neocortex, but there is something that we say that because we just add uh, names, but this is not true. There are many regions, for example, in the dog, to identify layer one and two is okay, but then three, four, five, six is, is impossible because you don't see really layers. So we assume that there are six layers, but this is not the case also. Now, when we talk about the pyramidal neurons, which is are two major types of neurons in the cortex, pyramidal cells and uh, interneurons or double neurons. So to understand the principle of the determined the synaptic organization and the digital geometry of pyramidal cells is essential to, uh, to uh, create uh, how to neural circuits uh, operate. So, the idea now is that to analyze the pyramidal neurons, which represent about 70 to 80 percent of the whole population, the action of the pyramidal neurons are the major source of excitatory synapses, and the spines of the pyramidal neurons are the major target of excitatory synapses in the brain. So it's critical to know how what is the structure of the pyramidal neurons and to find out if these are similar or different in different areas and species. So also pyramidal cells are responsible of the spread of activity through the axon collateral. For example, when you are studying epilepsy, for example, or the activity of behavioral activities between different cortical areas, we have to remember that this flow of information is through the axons of the pyramidal neurons. So this is the flow of information. So, the question is, is the pyramidal cell structure similar in all cortical areas and species? And why this is important to analyze? Why is important to analyze the morphology? So in the laboratory, what we are trying to do is to use uh, models to understand, to understand the morphology of the neurons by using uh, computational models. So this is the real neuron. And with the thing that we are doing is transform this uh, biological neuron in a virtual neuron based on mathematical approaches to uh, identify the, all the, the uh, morphometric parameters of the neuron. And to do that, <clears throat> we have a, a very powerful technique that is intracellular injections of fixed uh, human cortical tissue, or you can use in any species. The fantastic uh, 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 good news is that you can use in fixed material. Fixed material, therefore, you can use autopsies. People that you so the source of brains is practically is a, you have as many as you as you, you you need because you can get autopsy cases very easily. 
The, the problem is that the, this brain has to be in a good condition, but, but there are thousands and thousands of, uh, of brains that can be useful for, to analyze using the new technologies that we are applying in the lab. This is, for example, the, one of the samples we use intracellular injections with a marker, like in this case, Lucifer Yellow, it's a fluorescent marker. We can penetrate. This is labeled with DAPI to label the nuclei, then you penetrate within the neuron, and then you fill up the neurons, and you can find this fantastic uh, and good resolution with confocal microscopy. You can make uh, 3D reconstructions, and then you can see these fantastic spines. These are called learning spines because they are, uh, are thought that they are mobile, they are dynamic, they are the, and they are involved in, in learning and forming new connections. And these other, which are big uh, spines, are called memory because they are more stable and are thought to be the physical trace of our memories. Something like that it looks uh, science fiction, but that is something that is uh, very well now established, the spines are the major target of excitatory connections in, in the brain. So it's very important to analyze the number and the structure of the spines. So the morphological parameter, when you study this and you say, well, this is morphology, so what? And that is critical because the branching pattern is related with the degree of compartmentalization of inputs. Then uh, the size is also related with the density and uh, or the, the number of, uh, the, the you can sample, the number of uh, afferents that you can sample, the size of the, so there are many properties that is based on the morphological parameters of the density carbonization. <clears throat> so the variations are a resulting fundamental difference in functional differences. So now, if you can see in the literature, there are many, many papers in, in every, Every time in, in, in the, is increasing the number of papers just modeling the uh, morphology of the neurons compared rats, mouse, humans, because we have now these uh, technologies. The dendritic spines, as, as I say, almost all, almost all dendritic spines established at least one synapse, a CD2 synapse. So changes or differences in the number of spines in the dendritic carbon of neurons may influence uh, both uh, thermal system uh, cortical functions. So and then the size, the spine head, is correlated with the area of the postsynaptic density and with the number of postsynaptic receptors. The length of the spine neck, uh, which is this, is uh, proportional to the degree of bio biochemical and electrical isolation of the spines. And so larger spines generate greater synaptic currents than the smaller spines. Therefore, the, to uh, find out the size and describe the size and, and, and the shape of the spines is very important to analyze. I don't know how, what is the, how much I have been, uh, oh my God, I am very, very slow, I think. I don't know if, uh, when we should finish? You have yeah. like, it, it, it's up to you. Like, I think that five, 10 more minutes, it's time. My God, okay. <laughs> so, I, I always stop it and never pass the but We are enjoying the talk a lot. Okay. So, no problem. So, this is our uh, thing. So, now um, you have beautiful techniques to analyze the neurons, but now the problem is how you uh, count the number of spines and how you can uh, uh, analyze this data. So, now there are methods that uh, informatic tools that allow us to analyze. Um, more or less automatically, the total number of the spines, and we don't have to make an estimation that we say, well, but basically it's automatically. But the size and the shape of the spines, still we don't have a good method uh, to, to do it. So we are now working with uh, um, engineers, just yes, with um, deep learning, just to see if we can do this, uh, the, uh, analyze the size and the shape of the spines, uh, in, from each neuron automatically, because otherwise it would be very difficult. So the dream that we have here is to uh, map the whole dendritic map uh, of the, the spines. Each spine generates uh, synaptic currents. And imagine that there are 100,000 million uh, neurons in the brain, 
and each pyramidal neuron about 20 to 30,000 inputs. So the challenge is very, very is dramatic, it's tremendous no? to, to, to make models of the brain and how to analyze this thing. But we have the tools now to do this. So that this is to emphasize the importance that uh, of analyzing the structure of the neurons, the morphology of the neurons is critical to better understand the brain. Um, from the time of Cajal, when people start to analyze the morphology of the neurons, people say, well, for what? And this is not interesting. I mean, but now, every day, we are getting um, there are more and more people interested to analyze the fine structure of the neurons because you can then make models to better understand the brain. So you can see here in this uh, slide, we can make in multiple injections in many parts of the brain. So at the end, uh, you can, uh, the total number of spines, for example, is practically given to the total number of excretory automatic synapses on pyramidal cells. And you can compare within a given species different regions or dif different brain areas or compare between different species. So this is a fantastic tool to compare um, between uh, species. These are the uh, studies that we published several years ago when we compare the occipital temporal and the, and the frontal cortex, these are pyramidal neurons that have been cut or uh, uh, coronal. So the apical dendrites is going up in this uh, direction. You can see here that these neurons, the, the arbor is much bigger than the visual cortex. And when you compare the total number of spines, there are significant differences in the size, number, and bifurcations, spine density in the different cortical areas. When you compare uh, the mouse, this is the human, and, and the mouse, the uh, structure of the neurons, it looks very similar, as you can see here, it looks smaller, but uh, what happened here is that the complexity of the, of the mouse is much more, uh, very simple compared to the human. Now we are using also uh, different methods to analyze which is the functional implication of this, uh, of the size and the morphology of the neuron. We have several papers you can see in the PubMed, you can find some of these papers. But you can see also here that the neurons of the mouse are not only smaller, are less complex. And also the spines, you can see here the spine, the human spines are much bigger than the mouse. As I said before, the, synapse, the size of the spines is very important for the functional point of view. So it's not only numbers and morphologies, but also the functional implication of to have different structure. So now I'm going to go very fast to about variations in GABAergic circuits. So you, you, we have here the different types of neurons. Some of them innervate the, the dendrites, others innervate the soma, and others the action is a segment. These are the sandier cells, basket cells that innervate the perisomatic region, that this is called the perisomatic inhibition. And there are many different types of neurons. Basically, the connections are this, but the different morphologies are quite different. <clears throat> so before the introduction of parvalurin uh, and calvin in cell chemistry, it was impossible to know the distribution of double bunker cells, large basket cells, and sandier cells because with the Golgi method or other techniques, you were not able to visualize them. So then when we introduced in, in chemistry for uh, parvalumin and calvinin, uh, we then found that Sandler cell terminals are labeled with parvalumin, as you can see here, and double bucket cell actions are labeled with calvinin. And then you can apply these techniques uh, to visualize and to quantify the number of neurons in different regions of the brain. You can see here, the how different are the different cortical areas in based on the densities and also basket formation, channel terminals. You can see there are dramatic differences in the number and the distribution of in, in interneurons in the different parts of the brain. So a major question in, in neuroscience now in the human, when we analyze the human cortex, is what is the influence of the variations of cortical circuits in perception and cognition? That is something that I am asking, but not, but most people is not even thinking about this because people think 
that the human cortex is very uniform, as I said before, but there are, there are great variations, not only in the density, in the morphology and the distribution of interneurons. But it's something that we can discuss later if you want. But this is something uh, fundamental, is these variations in the structure. Um, if we don't start to think about these things, it will be very hard to understand how the, our brain works. And now, uh, just an, only an example of the variation in average interneurons in the species differences. Before the introduction of chemical techniques, it was thought that in the pyramidal cells, the proportion was the same in all the species, uh, three to one, so three pyramidal neurons per one pyramidal uh, interneuron. Then it was introduced in methochemistry to visualize neurons expressing GABA, which are interneurons. And now that we know that most uh, interneurons are GABAergic, is we know that the proportion of GABAergic neurons is higher in the human and primates compared to the mouse, about 25% in the, in the primates and 50% in the rat and, and mouse. This is an example of the human and the rat, the same microscopic field, the same size, everything the same. This is staining for carbretinine, which is a calcium binding protein that is found in a population of Gabalji neurons. You can see here that there are many more interneurons in the human compared to the rat. And now the last example is this, the double bucket cells that you can see uh, that they have like a horse tail uh, action with a very narrow action that make a microcolonial structure. When you cut this uh, section in the coronal section, you can see that they're very dense. So let's, uh, let's escape this one. So the calbinding is, is amazing because it's similar to the radial bundles of the, of the cortex. When you analyze the uh, human cerebral cortex with calbinding, you can see that they establish a very uh, fantastic, uh, beautiful microcolonial micro micro organization. That is double bucket cell with a very narrow uh, action algorithm. As you can see here, they make a, a inhibitory synapse and within a very narrow cylinder. So, and they are very numerous and regularly distributed, the long vertical trajectory and the of the actions and the very high number in, 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 in imply that these neurons are fundamental elements in the uh, microcolonial organization of the brain. However, these neurons are not found in, in, the, in many species that are practically found only in primates and some carnivores, but they are very, they are in the rat and the mouse. These neurons probably are present there, but they are not making this regular organization. So these are major differences between the human or primates and the and rodents. There are many other examples that I don't have time to talk today. So just to finish, the general conclusion is that the human neocortex share many common features with other non-human mammals, but also so many unique specializations that are likely to be crucial for human cortical function. The pattern of synaptic organization, the percentage, length, density of asymmetric and symmetric synapse, which are excitatory and inhibitory, I didn't have time to talk about this, is characteristic also of each cortical area and species. In these circuits, in different areas within the same or different species, differ considerably among themselves, and therefore data obtained in one area are not necessarily applicable to one in another. The, pardon, the laminar specific similarities between species might be considered as basic bricks of cultural organization. In contrast, the differences probably indicate evolutionary adaptations to brain circuits to particular functions. And I think that this is all. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>